I know. Violence. Yeah, because that's what it's about. The pathway to the beloved community. Nonviolence. It's, no it's way love in action. It yeah. is love in action. And we've seen a lot of it today too. Yes. We, throughout today, it's just been a constant thread. It's just been so amazing. So I'm excited to talk about this because we have so many applications that we can even share, you know, from today, just examples. Yes. There was a lot of uh, love and nonviolence in the way people were communicating today yeah. and in the solutions, uh, which was very powerful as people share today. And I, it is fitting to end with nonviolence, but also realizing that uh, some people don't understand what nonviolence is. So we want to start just by setting the record straight uh, briefly, because we have a nonviolent series that right. begins on August 2nd. So you'll see on the bottom there, it tells you how you can register for that. So this is 20 minutes, um, but we have a three part <laughs> series and then even longer studies of nonviolence that help us understand what it is. But just a few things off of this list uh, that we wanted to share with you, that sometimes people think uh, nonviolence is just about turning the other cheek, but it's not, is it, Bonita? No, it's just not. about turning the other cheek. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's definitely more, more than turning the other cheek. Yeah, nonviolence is active resistance. So someone tweeted to us, Dr. King, uh, that your father would never use the word resistance to which we responded mm. no he used the word and he <laughs> believed in resistance he just resisted non-violently so as usual you know people had things that they thought dr king yeah. would say or he did say uh, that were incorrect but non-violence is active resistance it does resist it just resists non-violently and yeah. sometimes people think non-violence is rooted in fear but it's really rooted in what we're talking about today, love. And, and, and I, I just want I just want to I want to encourage people to read, read, and read Dr. King. Read my some mother, more. That, yes. yes, my mother used to always say he wrote several books. Go to the primary source and read it all. I mean, he was a prolific writer, so uh, there's enough here for us to all understand uh, what he wrote and 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 to not be mistaken. Uh, by these, you know, excerpt parts that people continue to use. Yes, nonviolence does resist. It just does not resist in the way that is violent. Right. Constructive. It's it's a constructive way of resisting, and it engages right. all of your mind, your heart, your spirit, and does that through your physical body without bringing harm to another person. Because it has that's an a, ultimate goal in mind. Yeah. Yeah. It has an ultimate goal in mind. And what is that ultimate goal? Beloved community. The beloved community. Yeah, that's right. The beloved community. Absolutely. That's right. So you're taking a look at this. You'll get more of this when you take the series. You want to go to the next slide and mention as we go uh, that nonviolence does respond to injustice. It doesn't ignore it. And it believes that, you know, true peace includes justice it just doesn't seek to defeat people but you'll learn more about that in the series too benita you want to tell us about the definition oh this absolutely Dr. King's quote the definition is on the next slide but this yeah. is a strong quote well go ahead and share the quote Benetta. <laughs> we want yeah, to hear no, I don't want to. Yeah, we, no, we want to see the quote. Let's go back to the quote, back to the quote. because it is, it is a it's a very uh, important quote before we transition to the definition. Can, can we go back one uh, slide? It's nonviolence. It's not sterile passivity, but it's a powerful moral force which makes for social transformation. Yeah. And I think we've seen that throughout today. You know, we've just seen the commitment to it. When I listen to that economic, uh, dealing with economic injustice with Ashley Bale uh, and just the, the, the moral commitment, even when you have to go into your large law firm and, and, and challenge them uh, about the way we do business, because I think he wanted to feel a sense of congruency that if I'm going to be out here doing this, I need to challenge the people I work with to make sure uh, that we are aligning. I think he said, "Are you banking your values?" That was that was really mm -hmm. good. So, yeah, that yeah, was that good. was that was yeah. good. Made me think. I need to switch up a bank. 
Yeah, made me think too. And I know Dr. King has always been committed to making sure while she banks across the board, I know I know for sure she banks black. So uh, I bank yes. black. I definitely bank bank black. Yeah. So let's go. <laughs> let's go to the uh, definition of nonviolence. And we, like we said, we're going through this very quickly because we do have a segment coming up, a training session coming up in next month. And so, mm-hmm. yeah. So we invite everyone to uh, to join that tra- to register for that training session. Just go to the KingCenter.org because one of the things you're going to learn is how to apply what we call nonviolence as a love centered way of thinking, speaking, and acting that leads to personal, and we say that first for a reason, to personal, cultural, and societal transformation, because you're going to learn about an inside-out transformation and inside-out application. So you heard the book today that Dr. King and uh, Dr. Johnson have have written. Uh, It starts with me. Nonviolence, it starts with me. It starts from within. That transformation takes place on the inside before you can do any of the outside work. And it will show up in how you act, how you lead, how you speak, and and how you think. And I'll say this real quickly. One of the things nonviolence has truly, truly taught me is to how to audit my thought life because those thoughts Mm. turn into actions, turn into words. And so it's very important. So let's go to the principles. We're going to go at a very high level on the principles. Next slide, please. Uh, And I'll dive in with the first principle. I think that's the one I'm supposed to take. Um, So the six principles, you know, we want to make sure that uh, we share with you all first that this is the foundation. We call the, uh, the principles the wheel, building up the wheel, building up that inner being. So you got to have some principled uh, a, a principled way of when you go out to address injustice and when you go out and try to deal with any so societal ills, you want to make sure that you're principled. And these are our principles. And so I'll start off with the first. Nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. And again, I want to just kind of go back through the thread of today because we've heard whether it was Jose Vargas or whether it was, like I said, Ashley Bale, uh, uh, Shane Claiborne of the a red letter Christians, when he talked about him having to deal with uh, the people who are strong evangelicals. And he saw that, you know, some of those strong evangelicals that he was a part of were some of the most gun toting death penalty advocates that he could imagine. And it didn't uh, align with his spiritual application, his, and what he believed as in his faith, a Christian. And so he had to start speaking out. And so when you start speaking out as a well life for courageous people, you have to start thinking about the fact that you have to, you're going to have to count up the cost because it's going to, it may cost you friendship, allies, and what you perceive as allies, because now you're going against the grain, uh, but you can't help but do it because something in your inner being just can't align with that, which is unjust, that which is not love. Because we believe that in nonviolence, love will correct everything that stands against love. So this is a way of life. You don't have a choice. You wake up being this thing. So I'm going to toss it. uh, No, I got principle two, too. So let me uh, just go on. So nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. Now, we call this the end in mind principle. Because the reason why you're seeking to win friendship and understanding is because reconciliation is always a part of the beloved community. You, you want to always make sure you keep re, uh, relationships intact. So this is how you do what you do. So when you are seeking to deal with an injustice, when you are seeking to deal with a problem or even a conflict, you're going to do it in a way where you always keep in the end result in mind. So you're going to seek to win friendship and understanding. You're not trying to win over people. You're trying to win people over. And, you're, and we also believe that the means exist within the ends. So how you do what you do matters. And so you're going to always do it with the end in mind, always want to seek to have relationships intact. So I'm going to toss it over to you, Dr. King. Yeah. And you know, uh, when you're fighting injustice and oppression and and evil, it, it, it arouses a lot of emotion inside of you, especially towards the people who may be doing the evil and doing the injustice. And it causes you initially to maybe want to retaliate or bring harm uh, to those people uh, to humiliate them because they have humiliated you. 
But nonviolence gives you the discipline and the strength to rechannel that emotion into focusing all of your aggression towards the injustice or uh, the evil uh, act. Uh, and so the third principle is about nonviolence seeking to defeat the injustice and not the people. Because again, you want to keep that end goal in mind, that, that ultimate goal about the beloved community. You don't want the conversation to change. A lot of times when you see uh, injustice, and, and people get involved and people come, uh, you know, we've seen it on the news media, for instance. As soon as people have infiltrated many of the nonviolent marches, unfortunately, you know, the story changes. It's now about the rioting and the looting and no more about the evil and the injustice that the nonviolent people were trying to bring attention to. And so nonviolence wants to make sure the person who embraces it wants to make sure that we focus all of our aggression towards the injustice. And then we focus our conciliatory uh, towards the individual because in the end, as Benita said, we're trying to win the friendship and understanding. We're trying to find a pathway that's a win-win pathway. And we wanna get to the ultimate goal of the beloved community where there is reconciliation. So that's the third principle. Seek to defeat injustice, not the principle. The second one is the hardest one in all of the principles that uh, that exist. <laughs> Everybody who has come to our training struggles with this principle. So if you have come through it and you are still struggling with it, it's all right. And when you come through it and get in touch with it and you're still struggling with it and you want to reject it, I get it uh, because it is difficult. What you see on the screen is that oh, nonviolence nobody believes the that unearned suffering for a cause is redemptive my god why do i as a as a member of a group who has suffered for generations have to suffer some more i don't but what i can say is that if we want to bring about transformation there has to be a group of people who understand that there's power when there is a willingness to sacrifice to bring an issue of injustice, evil and wrongdoing to the surface. And so when you approach any kind of nonviolent campaign, you approach it with that in mind. You approach it with, look, I am not going to be the inflictor of the suffering. I am not going to retaliate in the midst of the violence. I'm gonna have the discipline to elevate things to another level because I believe that by me standing there in the strength and the power of my spirit and my heart and my emotions in, in love towards <laughs> even my adversary, that I am going to awaken or tap into something inside them. And I'm also going to begin to arouse people who are looking on because you want to win other people into the cause as well. And so we take on this suffering willingly this has nothing to do with domestic violence. You don't stay in that kind of suffering situation. There are things that are immediately harmful personally that you have to remove yourself from. But when you're in a nonviolent demonstration and a campaign, you willingly take this on for a higher cause. That's what C.T. Vivian did when he was chair of Jim Clark. That's what John Lewis, Amelia Boynton, Hosea Williams, and so many others on that bridge did that day on Bloody Sunday when, when, they, when they faced Jim Clark and all the rest of them. Uh, they put their bodies on the line because they earnestly believe that their willingness to do this and suffer would end up being redemptive. And who would have ever thought that John Lewis on that bridge that day would one day be a congressman from the South and serve two terms under the first African-American president. Unearned suffering willingly as you do it can be redemptive. And it may not come directly to you, but it can come to other generations and other people. Okay, we believe you, Dr. King. <laughs> <laughs> but Nita's still looking at that principle with side eye. <laughs> side eye. <sighs> this is what else nonviolence does. This is a, a principle of nonviolence as well. Principle five. Nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. And I was just thinking, you know, nonviolence is about choices. Life is too. But sometimes, you know, the choices are in our, our choice to be how we condition ourselves. And so we may think, you know, I don't have a, 
I, I don't have a capacity to change how I behave or how I speak or how I treat people, then I have to choose to change my conditioning. But when I think about this principle, I think I need to recondition myself to choose love. So that I, in my language, I have mantras that I say every day. I have playlists that I listen to. I have things that I read. Uh, and some of it's regimented because I really believe I as a human being should choose love instead of hate. But if all my life I've learned hate, and if, if in spaces I've been in, I've learned how to hate more than I've learned how to love, then I have to be conditioned to choose love. And it's about choices. So nonviolence even chooses not to violate people, even the person. I choose not to violate myself uh, internally. So there's a component here of choosing self-love and self-care, not being self-centered, but choosing to care for ourselves. That's very important to our mental health, to our spiritual health, and to our physical health as well, to choose love instead of hate. Um, that's how we treat other people. That's how we treat the environment. And that's how we treat ourselves. It's a choice. So as people say on Twitter, sometimes they'll say somebody woke up and chose violence <laughs> in response to things that people tweet. We get to wake up every day. Isn't it amazing? And yeah. choose love. Choose love. Mm -hmm. We can wake up every day and choose love. That's the fifth principle. Sixth principle is nonviolence beliefs. The universe is on the side of justice. And we know uh, Dr. King was a, a Baptist minister, a Christian, a man of great faith. This philosophy of nonviolence for him was very much connected to his faith in Christ and the Beatitudes and Christ's teachings in Matthew 5. Uh, but we also know that he believed that other people of different faiths could subscri subscribe to nonviolence. So nonviolence believes that there's a companion that in the universe, justice is what will win. Maybe we can put it that way. And yeah. when I replace justice here, with Dr. King's definition, it changes my mind. I mean, yeah. it just mm -hmm. opens up the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. When I say this, nonviolence believes the universe is on the side of love correcting everything that stands against love. Yeah. I can't refute that. I have to believe that the universe, the cosmic companion, God as I call him, is on the side of us being love to correct those things that stand against love. It's the sixth principle. We go into it more August 2nd through 5th in our Applying Nonviolence series. Then we'll go to the steps and Benita will start us off with step one. All right. Thank you, Vanetta. So uh, we call this part the skill, the methodology, how you do what you do. And so this first step, I can be, a, I'm a living witness that the first step in nonviolence can save you a lot of trouble. You might not even need to get involved with the conflict. The issue that you think is an issue may not be an issue. You, when you do all your information gathering, a lot of times this will solve some of your own questions. But information gathering is the first step. It's very important for you not only to be informed about your issue and your problem and where you stand on the issue, but be informed about what your what your opponent is thinking. You know, be uh, uh, be informed about the issue. Be informed about the organization that you're thinking about uh, challenging or direct action uh, before you do any of that. You got to make sure you're well informed, and you don't do it to prove a point. You, right. you do it so that you'll have the right information to make the right assessment of what strategy is necessary. So this is a very, very important uh, step here. And we go really into how important it is when you're talking about social change, even when you're talking about dealing with conflict, de-escalating de conflict. Uh, this is a very crucial step. It's the beginning of being able to solve, uh, doing a thorough assessment uh, understanding the issue is very key to solving any problem, addressing any issue. Uh, and I know Jose Vargas, that was a thing that he's challenged us. If you want to solve immigration, become well-informed, study it, get your information. It's very essential before you address any issue. First step in nonviolence. Second Absolutely. step, you want to take, it, take it for us? Second step is education. Listen, we're, we're in some turmoil right now uh, because I believe basically... There are many of us who are uneducated about voting laws that are being passed, about critical race theory, 
So we see people tweeting and talking about things that when we start to talk, we realize uh, we're not willing and we're not educated. And anytime we're going to attempt to um, eradicate an injustice, we need to be educated on the root of the issue and the symptoms of the issue. So we need to understand where it came from, what are the manifestations of it, who's a part of it. So this education is very important. It's hard to talk about eradicating voter suppression if we're still talking about these laws as though the only things included are passing out water and voter ID. And we don't understand the veto power that's included. And we don't understand the ability to determine who's even in certain positions in states. So education is very important. We encourage you to get into these steps, to study with us, to understand that nonviolence can help us be strategic and love-centered in not cooperating with evil. So second step, education. Let's find out all we can about it so that we know how to approach it. Third step, Benita. So that third step, personal commitment. You know, uh, this is very crucial too because you don't want, you know, I, I you don't want to start addressing an issue uh, and you haven't counted up the cost. Uh, you want to make sure you've counted up the cost. And, I'll, and let me let me back up. The first personal commitment we believe in is being committed to the philosophy of nonviolence right. because you want to make sure you're committed to dealing with this in a way that's love centered. So that's the first commitment. And then you need to make sure your personal commitment is aligned to the issues that you're addressing because you're run out of fuel. So many people are running out of fuel. Uh, they uh, they're getting angry. They resort to all other types of things because you a you have to make an, a, a commitment to stay centered in what you believe and make a commitment in the pathway of getting the outcome. So we believe that nonviolence is our pathway. And so we make a personal commitment to stick with that, stick with the philosophy, stick with the methodology and then check your motives. Why are you doing what you do? That's very important when you start to look at personal commitment. Why am I doing this? You know, am I doing this for the greater good of humanity or do I have a drum major instinct? And we'll talk about that too when we go into the training. So uh, Dr. King? Well, these, these next two steps, I, I like to keep them together personally. They're step four and five. And by the way, none of these steps are like stair steps. You do one then you move to the second and the third and the fourth and you're done with one, two, three, four. They are always circular working in a related in a, in a related fashion. You will be doing information gathering, even as you're making your personal commitment, you know, because because things change, circumstances change. You know, there are things that new come on the scene when you're dealing with injustice and people have a spirit of trying to, to resist change. They may throw another wrench in the program. So you really do uh, have to be pulling all of these steps together uh, in a whole. But these two right here, negotiation and direct action to me are like the fuel of social change. Um, many times when we're looking at uh, things in society, issues that people are standing up and, and voicing uh, their, their concerns about, um, it's usually in the context of some kind of nonviolent demonstration. Uh, and, and we dip, typically call that some kind of direct action. And I always say, I want to encourage people to really study all of these steps because direct action, as you see here, is like a fifth step. You know, uh, it's a fifth step in the sense that it's, it's, a, it's a tool, it's, it's a strategy. Nonviolence is very strategic. We don't want to water down the fifth step, which is direct action. Um, we want to make sure it's used appropriately. Um, that's what information gathering does to them. We'll talk about that in the training as well, how information gathering relates to direct action, helping you to decide, you know, what form of direct action you want to use, when you want to use it, all that kind of stuff. But even before you get to that stage where you want to demonstrate it and protest and sit in or lie in or whatever you want to call it, there's a thing called negotiation. Uh, and a good thing about information gathering and even education is it prepares you for that negotiation table so that you frame yeah. the issue and you can go to the table with your demands or your requests um, and, and you even decide on those things that you are, you are willing uh, to say, okay, I'll give that up. Not your principles, though. You never negotiate your principles away. Timetables are one thing, uh, but you always stay true to the principles. Uh, so negotiation is that that stage where you go to the table and you try to get these requests or these demands met. 
Um, and when it doesn't work is when direct action comes into play. For that in them, it was a tool to dramatize the issue, to bring creative tension to the issue so that those people who have either refused to negotiate with you from the beginning, or if they start negotiating with you and they make false promises and don't keep them, or if they start negotiating with you and refuse to come back to the table, you bring that pressure through direct action uh, to get them back to that, that table. Uh, so direct action is really about dramatizing an issue. It's about bringing that necessary creative tension uh, uh, to, it, to an issue. And it's also about making sure that the issue is clear in your direct action. That's why those principles are very important to employ as you're practicing these steps. Do not do the direct action without re realizing I'm seeking to defeat injustice, not people. I'm trying to win over people. Uh, friendship and understanding. This is a courageous act. The ultimate goal here is that the universe is on the side of justice. I'm choosing love and not hate in my negotiation. I'm not being mean-spirited and nasty at the negotiation table. When I get to direct action, I don't say F the police. Hmm. Ouch. So I'll just leave it at that for now. <laughs> you dropped the mic. You dropped the mic. I dropped the mic out. Well, we're, we're almost I'm talking to you, Elder. Thank you. Thank you. As you do with the sixth step, as you do. The sixth step for many people is like the fourth principle. It's like, say what now? Because we're trying to figure out, I believe in general, when will we ever consult for there to be a reconciliation mm -hmm. uh, to, for us to get back together. But this is talking about uh, we weren't always this way as human beings. How do we get back to the pathway of love and justice? And the issue that arises with reconciliation often is we talk about it without talking about what's included with it. Justice, truth, repentance, in a lot of instances, reparations is not a matter of saying, let's just move forward and get along. But reconciliation means we have determined together that we're going to move forward on a humane, equitable, peaceful, just path, which is a part of the King Center's mission, by the way, to help the world get there using nonviolence. So we'll teach more about all of these principles, all of these steps. When you register for and join us for our August 2nd through 5th Applying Nonviolence series. So we just want to remind you to be a part of that, that we weren't trying to give you um, full, a full session, a full series on nonviolence. Just want to give you some highlights to encourage you to be a part of our next virtual series in the month of August. So thank you all so much. And you don't say F the police because you're about reconciliation. You're not about reconciliation. friendship and understanding. Uh, and you're not about humiliating because you were humiliated. That's right. But you're about yeah. keeping it on the issue. So thank you all. Uh, That's yeah, you don't, win attack, win. You don't attack the people. The people, yeah. 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 That's the yeah. issue all day, every day. Um, so so it's yes. a powerful. It's, it's a what? I was just saying, it, you know, it's really a powerful training. I think all of us ha can attest to how nonviolence has personally transformed our lives. So I just really hope that people take advantage of next month's training because I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I was one of those people. I wouldn't, you know, say F the police and all that kind of stuff, but I definitely knew how to attack you. I knew how to do it. And I, being, a, being an Arkansas born country girl, you know, we would get a whipping if you came home and didn't beat the person up who tried to jump on you. <laughs> so <laughs> you, had, you, had, country. you had to win. Country. So, yeah. Did you have to beat him with a stick? You had, we, you know, we didn't necessarily, we, we fought, honestly, we didn't believe in weapons. You had to fight with your fist and you had to take them out. And so this take has been, a, you had to take them out. You know, Aren't you, you glad you learned to choose love? I oh, am no. I'm very grateful because yeah, it, it does a whole right. lot for your soul and it does a lot for your spirit and what you put off, what you emit into the world, what you emit into the universe. And uh, for me, it's, 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 it's amazing, especially your thought life. I think that's the most amazing thing for me. It's cleansing. And, and, I'm grateful and, for and love. Yeah, I am too, because the energy that is involved in hate in mm. rage, in bitterness, in anger, uh, it depletes you. Yeah, you be you become depleted in that process, uh, yeah. and I'm not gonna let anybody deplete me. 
<laughs> Absolutely. I wanna, I, yes, I want to be fueled, you know, with love.